this. Um, well, welcome, because what we have here, right to my right, is a true living legend. He's been called one of the greatest cartoonists today, and that's no hyperbole. But I wanted to test that, so I reached out to some of Jules's colleagues and said, what do you think? I said, is Jules the greatest cartoonist working today? Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> this is your life. Uh, Art Spiegelman we got on the phone, and Art said... He doesn't know <laughs> what he's talking about. <laughs> that's why when Art said he's certainly near the very pinnacle, that's why he doesn't know, because it's not near, right? You are the pinnacle. Gary Trudeau said to me, Jules is at the very, very top. And uh, he said he, he wouldn't even mind if, if, if you were willing to say that about yourself. He said it wouldn't bother him. <laughs> And Gary and uh, Art Scott McLeod said he has you have a resilient, adaptable mind, but your convictions remain stand the test of time. Is that fair? I'm willing to sell out to whoever will make an offer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm just having gotten an offer it's all these years. Yeah. <laughs> My question is: Wasn't I asked him what hasn't Jules done? as a cartoonist, as a humorist, as a children's book illustrator, as a screenwriter, as a playwright. Um, you've pretty much done it all. You've done so much that even your old girlfriends are showing up at these signings, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, he, he won, a, won a Pulitzer Prize at the Village Voice, the Dear Departed Village Voice, right? But you were, in, yeah, you were an institution for more than four decades. Uh, you. Uh, You've got Obie Awards. Uh, you're in the Comic Book Hall of Fame. Your lifetime achievement, the Writers Guild of America, right? Look, they're here because they know this. <laughs> yeah, you okay. Don't have to. I was waiting for that. But the main thing I want to say: Do they know in January you turn 90 years old, and with oh, thanks. <laughs> and with your graphic your graphic noir trilogy, including the brand new one, The Ghost Script, you are as creative as ever. Please give a huge welcome to an rare appearance to Mr. Jules Pfeiffer. Thank you. So let, me, so let me ask, you told me three years ago you were working at, at the highest level you felt like you ever have in your career, that it's all there. Um, is that still the case? And, and what is it? Why now? Well, let me, let me start in a convoluted way. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I'm very honored by this and moved by this. And um, it would be remiss if I did not say I want to dedicate this whole uh, afternoon to a, a great cartoonist friend of mine, Erwin Hazen. Mm, yes. Um, <laughs> Erwin and I used to, Erwin was four foot one, or he was a very little guy, and, 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 he, uh, and he and I would do a certain amount of drinking in, during, my, during my drinking days, which have stopped, and his drinking days never stopped until he was dead. Um, but um, at, in the Cafe des Artistes in New York, and, and, and on West 67th Street, and by the third drink, Erwin would be a little bleary-eyed, and he'd look at me, and he'd say, I can't believe, I can't believe I got away with it. <laughs> and I said to him, Erwin, that's what every cartoonist says. <laughs> None of us can believe we got away with it. Yeah, yeah. Because the idea of making your life's work about what you loved as a kid and all the grown-ups thought was kid, were kids' work. And as you grew up, they went on to the real world, which was essentially being unhappy in everything they did. <laughs> and, and you went on doing what you wanted to do when you were a kid and refining and reforming that and playing around with it. And, 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 and then somehow making a life out of it of course you think you got away with something. <laughs> and, and, and it's a wonderful feel. And, and as I got older and clearly had to get out of New York, which was killing me because 
uh, e e even if even people in their early 80s were out walking me. Uh, it was just the, the city which I used to adore and 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 glory in became a daily reminder of my mortality, and I was at death's door unless I got out of there. And I got out of there. I'd been teaching a class called Humor and Truth uh, out at, at Stony Brook Southampton College on the Southampton campus. And I'd made friends there, and, and um, uh, I tried living out there, and it seemed to take. And, and, um, but the problem was that you, you, my hearing had gone. I couldn't write plays anymore. It wasn't a good idea because I couldn't hear the plays I'd written, and you can't hear actors in rehearsal. I had to find another form of working out there that would make sense because uh, I had to go on making a living, and I wanted, and I had to work anyhow because that's what I do. That's my, and I started fooling around for uh, uh, trying to write a noir book, and after three or four pages of prose, I got bored silly, and I said, well, maybe I'll try to make it a graphic novel and have a little more fun with it. And suddenly I was writing Kill My Mother, and I didn't, and, and all because I was living in a new location hmm. that, um, where I had to do something, because uh, it's not just a matter of work, it's my life, is, this is my form of play, and, it, and it's, so I, st so I came up with the idea of this noir graphic novel. I came up the this, uh, and um, and I found unintentionally, or never by plan for a second, that I was returning in thought and style and approach to the kind of comics that I started wanting to do as a kid when I was a little boy. I mean, when my heroes were. Milton Kniff, who did Terry and the Pirates, and who essentially taught me how to tell a story, uh, because I, I, I was, a, you know, but by the time I was seven years old, I was a scholar of Terry and the Pirates, you know, studying <laughs> panel by panel, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Terry and Pat Ryan, the Dragon Lady, Burma, you know, and, and uh, the, the China Seas, and the uh, and remarkable stuff mm -hmm. from that day to this, and. Um, and then the young Will Eisner, who was from the first page he ever did, called Muss Em Up in, you know, in WOW Comics, mm -hmm. to everything I saw him do after that. And, um, and I wanted to be one of those guys. I wanted to do this kind of work. The only thing was that I couldn't draw in that style. I was no good at it. I mean, I would... Uh, that You're very humble uh, about that. No, but, well... You know that I had tried to, you know, the 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 real cartoonists, the guys who made a living out of the profession, the Kirby's and all the other you know they they, um, they knew how to handle the brush where they got a slick and thin a, a thick and thin p a brush line and they go like this you know and they and Eisner was remarkable at it and they all were, and and my brush line looked coagulated glue you know <laughs> it was just terrible and 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 the drawings weren't much good. And I realized that I had to, I was not going to be an adventure strip artist, even mm. though that's what I really wanted. Mm. So I had to settle for this other crap, overthrowing the government. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's uh, I didn't want to go into the business of overthrowing the government. <laughs> but, 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 but at that time, the government cooperated by becoming a government that needed to be overthrown. So... <laughs> So I spent those intervening years, which I now consider my middle years, uh, overthrowing the government, and and that worked out nicely for me. The, uh, but the results were very mixed. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and 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 as soon as I stopped, we got the worst government we've ever had. So I shouldn't have stopped. I, <laughs> all right. Amen to that. Answer. You see how long I answer these questions. Oh, so I've moderated you before. I've timed this. I have okay. I have three and a half questions. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> So here is the portrait of the artist. Here's Jules at six with that, that look in his eye to be the next Milt Kniff. And there we see your early self-portrait with the, it, you know, the co coagulated line. But uh, 
No, but, but what fascinated me, like you talked about, you have Ultraman, and you could see very early on you were doing your, your superhero, you know, even as a boy. Yeah, yes, I, I was, uh, I loved, um, like, you know, all kids, I thought Superman was terrific, and Eisner had a ripoff of Superman. Um, so I used to remember these things. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, if Eisner could have a ripple of Superman, I could have a ripple of yeah, Superman. Yeah. So was that Ultraman? Yeah, you yeah, talked I mean, about I Ultraman. Comic books cost a dime in my day when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. I mean, comic books essentially started when I was eight years old, that's 1937, 36, something like that. Yeah. And um, which with reprints. And the original comics, uh, originally drawn for the comic books, I think started around 37. Yeah. And... Um, and Siegel and Schuster were right there from the beginning. Yeah. And I wrote extensively about the uh, the creation of Superman. And, 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 and uh, uh, first I wrote an article for the New York Times in a, who, who was, has these year-end mm -hmm. celebrations of people who died, and they asked me to write about Jerry Siegel. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about the Jewishness of the superhero, you know, mm -hmm. and... and um, um, and the, the, because the, 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 uh, these kids from Cleveland during the rise of fascism and, and, and Native American fascism in the Middle West, how funny. Who ever heard of such a thing? Yeah. And, uh, and isolationism and anti-Semitism and racism. And, and they were um, these kids in high school trying to find a place for themselves and... and um, and feeling outside, and all the jocks in the school were going out with Lois Lanes, and they were thinking uh, that um, uh, if they only knew what I was really like, and that's what <laughs> Superman was. Yeah. The, the kind of the, the uh, assimilation dream of the nerdy Jewish boy who couldn't get a date. <laughs> And, you know, if, if, if that girl would only go into a telephone booth with me, she would find out what I really am. <laughs> and, and, and what I really am is the same schmuck I am outside the booth, but not in my fantasies, and I'll put those on paper, and I'll get rich and famous, and then exploited, and then get trashed by the people who, you know, you know the usual story. <laughs> that old song and dance, yeah. right? Yeah. So you, it, you're in the Bronx. You're a Bronx-born boy, and it's not just comic book heroes. It's not just Milt Kniff. It is, you're, it is radio heroes, and it's going to the movies, right? And it's all escape. Yeah. It's all in a form of escape. And you're also drawing Jack Dempsey and Max Baer and your early fighters. But you see, these... It's called escape. It wasn't escape. It was, was survival. It? Yeah. It's. I mean, these were documentaries of my future as I saw it. Mm. And um, there was, when Fred and Ginger danced during the Depression, those were not escapist moments. Those were those were religious moments. Mm. They taught us how to have hope for the future. Wow. And that whole generation that I come out of, and some of you, uh, a few of you older people who are not nearly as old as I. Thank God, thank God. Uh, are, uh, no, that, that uh, there was a sense throughout the Depression years that somehow we would all triumph. Nobody felt defeated. Nobody yeah. felt that we, we were doomed. We felt just the opposite, that we, we, it was all going to work out mm. somehow or other. Yeah. And, uh, and that had as much or more to do with the fact that radio was coast to coast, and everybody, and, and, and the entire country was one listening to Jack Benny and Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy and, and, and Eddie Cantor and, and uh, you know, all of the, and, and they laughed at the same jokes and they, they shared the same culture. And, uh, and the same thing with uh, when people went to movies once a week. I mean, that, that much of what went on was shared by everybody in the country because there was nothing digital to, you know, to, to go into your own little thing with. So yeah. everybody knew what everybody else knew, whether you were north or south or east or west, with, with differentiation, of course, but it was there, and it united the people, and it gave, it gave them, and the forms of entertainment gave us a sense, because the entertainment was so upbeat in so many ways, yeah. that it gave us a sense of, of, of our own future and our own survival. So <laughs> what was called escape, um, 
gave us the strength to go on much mm. more than sometimes what was happening in the real world. Mm. Yeah. And you have among those survivors, you, you have a lifelong love of Popeye, right? You're drawing him young and you were drawing him for IDW several years ago. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, uh, um, uh, the great E.C. Seagar, L.C. Crystal Seagar, created Popeye in 1929, the year I was born, and also the year of the Great Depression. Uh, I think Popeye may have also been born in January 29, when I was. So it was uh, quite natural I should write the screenplay for the movie. Yeah. Because they, they look for somebody who was born the same year as Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> And it was as talented as hell, right? And, and, and Seagar's, yeah. Yeah. Seagar, who was still underappreciated, mm -hmm. uh, he died very young at 1938, yeah. um, uh, wrote a very complicated, what seemed simple, uh, uh, story about Popeye and olive oil and, uh, and, 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 and all the adventures and the wildness that went on. And I loved it as a kid, but when I went back and read them as an adult, uh, before working on a screenplay for Popeye, I realized that, my God, this is pure genius and, and how remarkable it is. And it's like reading Samuel Beckett. And place, you know, it just is extraordinary. Yeah. And uh, it's, um, uh, th that was never reflected in the animated Popeye cartoons, which more people know than the cigar strips. But... The Seagull strips are pure and wonderful and gorgeous art. To this day, yeah. uh, I fall apart when I when I reread them. Mm -hmm. when, when I must say the best thing that happened to me as a result of the Popeye mu movie that I wrote, that that was uh, Altman directed mm -hmm. in Robin Williams' first film, is I had meant or had hoped that the movie would be a testament to Seagull. I thought Altman had moved far away from that, and I was pissed at him for that. But after the movie was, was had previewed for a, while, for a week or so, I got a call from Chicago. She announced herself as Seagar's daughter. Mm. She said a lot of people have said they want to honor my father, and, and they would do stuff that I thought was just bullshit. But I saw the movie yesterday, and you have honored my father. Mm. Thank you. And oh. I just fell apart. Oh. That's fantastic. Hmm. That is so good. So you're drawing Clifford. You moved to Clifford, right? Yes. Your first published strip. And uh, we're, we, you know, do, in, here's 1950, your color Clifford. And uh, what in, were you nodding to any influences there, or were you finding well, your own voice? Uh, well, I was, um, at that time, I was doing the script, spreading the spirit mm -hmm. for Eisner, which means I'd write them on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper with little layouts and balloons and indications of what the story, you know, what the, I wrote the dialogue and stick figures for the, what the pictures and layouts would be, knowing Eisner would go mm -hmm. over it and rewrite it and do this, and, but he would use that as a jumping off point. Yeah. And we had been doing that for a while, and then, um, and I thought I was so successful at it, and Eisner seemed to think I was so successful at it, that I thought, I'd ask him for a raise. Yeah. Now, <laughs> Eisner was a truly great and brilliant and wonderful man who I loved, but he was cheap as shit. And, and, <laughs> and he acknowledged that. Yeah. And he said, you're not worth it to me. I'll give you the back page. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me the back page for a strip, and I thought I would do a strip about a real Bronx boy in my real neighborhood, and yeah. I would call him Clifford. And, and he, what I wanted to do was in fact a kind of pre-peanuts peanuts. Mm. But I didn't have the skill or the imagination to do that. So I did just a little wise guy kid uh, who was like so many other wise guys in comics, but he, was, he happened to be a Bronx boy, that's all. And I never thought that I had done with Clifford what I should have been doing with Clifford, but mm. you know, I had the back page with a credit on it for two years or so before I got drafted out of Clifford and out of the spirit into the army mm. and what started my real life. Yeah, yeah. So what was it like being in the studio, not just with with, with cheap Will Eisner, but uh, the uh, 
you know, Jack Cole and, and Wally Wood and these guys, and you're 17, bear in mind he was 17 well, when Jack he's there. Jack Cole was not there. He, he yeah. had gone on to do, yeah. you know, he was doing Plastic Man by that yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. And I don't creator. think I think I met him once, maybe in Chicago. But yeah. but uh, I, I was a great fan of Jack Cole. Yeah. Um, but you're 17 and in this environment. Uh, uh, and um, uh, but Eisner had a. It was very curious being working for Eisner because he worked in a dark outer office where usually the secretary works. So you, in the inside office with all the lights, he had three or four drawing tables, and his assistants worked putting out the spirit, and I think it was just the spirit. I think there were no other, there might have been other, no, I think, I, I don't remember now. Um, I think in the beginning it was Lady Luck and Mr. Mystic, but they were brought in from the outside. Yeah. So we had a wonderful penciler um, and named John Spranger who was doing, uh, Eisner would scroll something and John Spranger would, would, would ink it, and, and then it went back to Eisner who would, I mean, would, he would pencil it and Eisner would ink it and change things as he, you know, just redraw everything and yeah. with, the, with this extraordinary facility. And he had a lettering man named Sam Rosen and he had another uh, background man. Um, I forget who it was in the beginning, but later became my friend Jerry Grandinetti from the Bronx. He had this whole staff turning out this material and when I first met them, I thought, this, they must be so honored to be working with this genius. But I found out they thought Eisner was old-fashioned, old hat, mm -hmm. and they had no interest in, I mean, this was just a gig to them. This mm -hmm. was, a, uh, uh, they didn't value the spirit. They didn't think this is revolutionary stuff. This yeah. is the groundbreaking. They thought it was just the reverse. Mm -hmm. And that I was the only one who knew the value of what was being done there. And what Eisner, and the, that was the reason I held the job, because I was, um, I had, the only way Eisner could use me was to erase pages and do this and do that. I was technically a doofus. I, you know, from, from that take to this, I am technically a doofus. And Eisner would patiently try to explain to me how things get done in comics, and I wouldn't, I'd nod my head and I, from that day to this, I didn't understand a word he said. But he got it all. He understood all the terms. He was very patient with me. Huh. And, um, but the reason he kept me around was that I was a scholar of Eisner. <laughs> <laughs> and I could talk to him about comics. Yeah. And I was the only one in the office that appreciated what he did hmm. and understood what he did. So he, 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 he kept me around yeah. as a kind of critic of the spirit and critic of Eisner who understood what he was trying to do and nobody else gave a shit wow. at the time. I mean, that, that I, was, I was the first spirit scholar. <laughs> uh, and, and that's what kept me, there was nothing else I was competent at doing. I would have fired myself in a week. <laughs> and, and finally, at a certain point, uh, when he, I suggested to him at a certain point, out of pure innocence, uh, I was just dumb. I said, you know, the, the artwork on the spirit now is better than it ever has been. But the stories were a lot better in 1940 and 41. Why don't you write as good stories as you used to? <laughs> wow. I said to him. Yeah. And, and, and I, I didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and I would have fired me for that. <laughs> and if... And Eisner said, well, if you think you can write one better, you go, you write one. So I wrote one. Yeah. And it became a story called Four and a Half Minutes or Twelve Minutes, you know, about a kid in the Bronx, of course a kid in the Bronx. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and it said, it will take you so many minutes to read this story, and by the end of it, the kid in the story will be dead. Yeah. And that was, and Eisner loved it. Oh, wow. And I was, and he would then rewrite, and, and I always thought, do damage to my beautiful <laughs> scripts. And, 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 and uh, uh, and but we, when we argue, we actually argue. I was by this time seventeen or eight, eight, seventeen and a half, and and I'm, I'm going back and forth arguing dialogue and and and, and style and what we change with his genius, you know. So, and 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 he's giving me points and he's taking, but he's treating me as a colleague, mm. collegially, yeah. not some schmucky kid <laughs> who just came <laughs> off the street. But it was amazing. Yeah. 
and uh, and he wasn't offended by you know, he just let me do the work. Wow. And 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 because he un- and even though the guys in the shop didn't know what they were getting. Um, he was always visited from the outside by young cartoonists, by older cartoonists who paid homage to him yeah. and wanted to be around him and, and, and hang out while he would and others and who came in. And, and uh, it was you know, terrific to see mm. how appreciated he was by, the, by other people who didn't work for him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So here you are in the 50s. You're, you're uh, at the board for the Village Voice and uh, beginning what would be a, a four decade, you know, it was rain. The way I used to look, but <laughs> I looked that way. <laughs> but, uh, and there's your first Village Voice strip, 1956. Um, and you just, uh, in, in, in both your style, your kinetic style, and also your passion for overthrowing the government and peeling away <laughs> artifice, I mean, did, did you feel that your voice came quickly at that point? I thought my voice did. Yeah. I knew what I was writing right from the beginning. I didn't know how to draw it. Yeah. So that first strip, is it still up there? No. Uh, well, yeah, that first strip I did in a kind of UPA style. Yeah. I thought, you yeah. know, the way the U, U, uh, Stephen Bazustro's UPA w- w- did this uh, abstract uh, uh, animated work. And, yeah. Um, and the second week, I drew in another style. And the third week, in another style. You went up for different artists were doing the strip for about a month. Uh, uh, I did, because I knew how to write the thing. Yeah. But I didn't know how to draw the thing. And, and um, I mean, it's interesting. I never thought I was a writer. I never considered myself a writer. But the writing was always more assured from the very beginning mm-hmm. than the artwork, which struggled to find a style and took about two or three months before it found a style to settle in. And yeah. then it could grow and you know, I could, that style could mature and change. Yeah. But it was, a, it was a natural evolution. In the beginning, I was just thrashing around like crazy <laughs> yeah. and using different, uh, I didn't like the way my line reproduced. So I would try other things besides pen and ink. I, 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 I took butchered, butchered dowel sticks yeah. that had a pointed end and put them in ink and I liked the gritty line that, and I tried anything I could wow. to to uh, make it look as if uh, the work had the quality that I couldn't give it with a pen and ink. Wow, wow! And were they paying five different artists at that point? That you could have convinced them of six different artists, right? And uh, well, I- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then can you talk about like with you know you start doing you branching out at this point here we have some of your collected stories um, you fall in well, with well the the, the, the uh, um, it, it's not that I was branching I mean Passionella which was the first book of uh, that's Passionella and other stories yeah which was the first book of narrative cartoons actually preceded the voice strip I mean the writing of it yeah uh, the um, no, that's not true. Uh, when I was in the Army, uh, which was the most, we haven't talked about that, the, <laughs> the really formative event yeah. in, my, uh, in, in my satiric life because it made a satirist out of me. So, and, and it made me give up the old dreams of being Kniff or Al Cap or any of those guys who were heroes to me when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to do a strip anymore. I wanted to be... Uh, uh, I thought the Cold War and 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 conformity in America and uh, in sympathy McCarthyism, which was just beginning, the, the, these and mind control and thought control. I thought these were the, what I had to cover and what I had to attack. And nothing was more mind control than the United States Army, which didn't give a damn whether you. I mean, the Army when you said you're sick, they they, they said it's a proven line, prove it and die. <laughs> And they weren't joking, yeah. you know. And so, uh, I didn't see my enemy in the army as the North Koreans, who meant nothing to me. My enemy in the army was the army, mm-hmm. and everything I could do to um, sabotage what the army wanted to do with me, which was making me a fighting man, <laughs> I managed to do and try to do. And for the first time, I, I was, with some degree of clumsy skill 
manipulating and maneuvering myself into a position to get what I wanted out of the army by not letting them do what they wanted to do with me, but to get me to a publications unit where I'd be safe, where I could draw cartoons attacking the army. <laughs> what seemed more natural? And somewhere along the line, I came up with the idea of Monroe, mm-hmm. M-U-N-R-O. Mm-hmm. Um, a four-year-old boy gets drafted by mistake. I wonder how I came up with that idea. <laughs> and 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 and, um, and the army doesn't acknowledge mis- that mistakes because and that was my that that's almost a documentary. The army didn't acknowledge mistakes. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And and um, so I wrote that over it, and because I was inventing a form that didn't exist at that point, it took me almost two years or a year and a half to write um, a, a fairly close version to what the finished was. I kept revising and revising and making it better and stronger, but uh, it was that idea, you know, and, and, and I saw this as a survival mode for myself, you yeah. know. But it also, it told me that, in the f- that what I wanted to do now was this kind of narrative cartoon that attacked uh, what I found what was wrong, you know, that, that was real satire as opposed to kind of the soft satire one found in, the, in newspaper comic strips. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I knew that was not for syndication, and I knew that had to be in books uh, uh, or publications. And that's that became my ambition, but it wouldn't have been had I not been drafted. So yeah. the army gave me uh, the the bare bones of the career that followed, and I never would have thought of it had it not been the army. <laughs> it, gave, it gave me a real enemy yeah. who wasn't who wasn't Jewish and wasn't pretending they were doing these awful things because they were doing they loved me so much. <laughs> so so without feeling so I free of the guilt of my mother and my father and all the relatives <laughs> and the schools, for Christ's sake, yeah. pretended to teach you and taught you bullshit, yeah. uh, I, uh, I, w- I, I, could, I was free to deal with an enemy who, who acknowledged and hated me, <laughs> and I could hate them. Yeah. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't have to ship out to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, they, they tried, but I, talked, I managed to even, get, even outfox them in that way. Yeah. I, I, it, it, it's... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At one point, I was out in the middle of a field after having won one more battle somehow against all odds, and I'm crossing this field, and just then the flag starts to go down and taps, and you're supposed to stand and salute uh, the flag, and, this is, uh, and, 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 and I had just come from this unlikely victory where I wasn't going to be shipped out. I was going to go instead to a publications unit in New Jersey to do what I wanted to do. And as I stood there saluting the flag, I said as loud as I could, I fucked the army, I fucked the army, I fucked the <laughs> And that was, you know, and that was the begin. that was in fact the beginning of my, um, uh, my you know early manhood, which was really my delayed ad- adolescence, because <laughs> it, as a Jewish boy in the Bronx, I was so busy trying to be a good boy so I wouldn't disappoint my mother yeah. that I didn't have uh, my adolescence didn't become, begin until I was in the army. At the same time, I learned to drink scotch, and 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 um, uh, that really helps with adolescence. Yeah, yes, <laughs> and. Um, and and began a rebellion that lasted until yeah <laughs> <laughs> half past right yeah and and so you we were talking about that you became as you become more political here we have the the as you a political playwright we have uh, the White House murder case yes. and you know going forward from little murders and you have fallen in with uh, you this professional and personal kinship and deep friendship with Mike Nichols and Elaine May and working with Alan Arkin, and it just seemed like you, going forward through carnal, carnal knowledge and everything else, you guys just were all simpatico. Well, it's interesting. In the beginning, you're alone and you think you're working alone, and nobody else is doing this stuff. And um, the voice did not pay me. They didn't have any money, or they claimed not to. Even if they were paying other people, they didn't tell me. So I was working to make a living at an animated cartoon studio in New Rochelle, uh, Terry Toons, where R.O. Blackman was also working on an animated version of his extraordinary Juggler of Our Lady. Yeah. And um, and I'd come home, and 
it was a wrong way commute from New York. Everybody was coming into the city from the suburbs. I was going up to New Rochelle where Ter Terry Tunes was headquartered and worked there and then come back at night and working in a tiny little apartment. I'd open up my dinner, a tuna noodle casserole, Stouffer's tuna noodle casserole, put it in the oven and sit in front of the TV. And one night, Omnibus was coming on and Alastair Cook introduces this young couple called Mike Nichols and Elaine May, who I never heard of. And I watched something extraordinary going to, I watched my stuff being done on TV. They did teenagers and they did uh, 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 Mike talking to his mother, who was Elaine, about, you know, and, and, and uh, 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 and I thought, this is what I do, but they're better. <laughs> and, and, but it was the same critical, you know, I mean, it was exactly in the same vein, whoever these people are. And I knew that I had to know them, I had to meet them, I had to find out about them. And there was, uh, I think uh, uh, they announced at the show that they were in New York at the Village Vanguard or something. So I mm -hmm. ran down there at the first opportunity and ran in after the show and introduced myself, and it turned out that they had been reading me from the very beginning. And we were, you know, we, it was a love feast from the start. Mm. And because, uh, and, and then I learned um, about the Chicago roots to all of this, and when I went to Chicago a year or so later, and, and went to Second City and discovered that, that, um, that the way they worked in improv getting ideas from the audience and getting, you know, it was exactly the way I wrote a comic strip. Mm. You know, that I'd start a panel, not worth knowing where it's gonna go. I'd figure out a line and then the next one, and the next one it would, you know, th things would just develop. But how I worked organically in my strip form was how the, in a much more complicated way, these wonderful improvisational actors uh, at Second City in Chicago at the time uh, would put together scenes. Yeah. And it's, it's a free-form way of working which allows you unselfconsciously and, and unknowingly to go from one thing to another, surprise yourself with what you do, and, and surprise yourself with the point you go, you're headed toward. Mm -hmm. And in my case, also surprise the reader by taking them quietly, without fanfare, and undramatically and very quiet uh, simple drawings so that the, the, the system won't be shocked and they're just paying attention to what they're reading. Uh, take them from something that looks very simple and looks very simple and then how you give them the insight in the last panel and give them something to recover from. Yeah. <laughs> yes. and, and that was you know, how I learned how to do this. Wow. But it was, uh, uh, and I loved doing it. I loved the chance and there was so much, I mean this is at an age post-McCarthyism by this time, uh, that we're uh, liberal college-educated young men and young women were afraid to voice their own opinions or talk openly because although it wasn't the time of Joe McCarthy, they, they, uh, it might injure their job opportunities. Yeah. It might injure their career advances. So they spoke secretly or in code. So everybody spoke in code. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, and it was my job to decode the code. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so that this was a comic strip that was really about language mm. and how language was not used to communicate but to disguise communication. Yeah. That language was used to bullshit. Yeah. And, uh, and so I was decoding the code makers and, and that became, so, so really what, I, what, what the career was about was not doing a comic strip, it was, it was Doing a piece about language and how the and the misuse of language was was how we governed, in our families, in our sex lives, in our marital lives, in in the country at large, in our politics, on every level, we were using language not to communicate. Mm. Yeah, perfectly said. So, let's get to, with you know when you've said when you started this noir trilogy scripting it years ago with, with Kill My Mother, you weren't, didn't set out to be political. 
but uh, but you're dealing with the blacklist, the same the same terrain that the front and Trumbo and, yeah. and other works since have worked on. But now when we read it, like um, and you also have the ghost script, you have Cousin Joseph, you have characters yelling lines like it's the immigrants, it's the immigrants' yeah. fault, yes. and 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 uh, identifying what is an American, who is an American, and you, we can't in our current era we can't read it and have it feel like it's ripped from the headlines. Uh, can you talk about the well, inherent? And all of that was unintentional. I had finished the script. Uh, the whole series was, in a way, unintentional. And, um, as I, uh, when I wrote, when I began writing "Kill My Mother," somebody else was supposed to draw it because I didn't know how to draw in that style. And when the publisher said nobody's going to want to read a book by you that somebody else draws. So, <laughs> so go home and try to do some drawings. By that, so I went to an art supply store and, and discovered that they were, they, in, in the interim, since I'd last looked around for this stuff, there were uh, brush pens that had been created mm -hmm. that could duplicate the kind of brush stroke that I couldn't do with a real brush. Mm -hmm. So that I could then uh, call, uh, these micron pens and and and, uh, um, and brush pens and um, tombos and and so that I could do my drawing as if it were in pencil with the looseness and freeness I always had, but it looked like a brush stroke. Mm. So the, the technology had changed to allow me to draw the way I always wanted to draw, yeah. to look like I was doing what they did, yeah. which I wasn't. But do it with a much more freedom, uh, and, and 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 to uh, and and style that kept to my style uh, that I that I wanted to. So it was it was a joy, uh, but it was also filled with insecurity because I thought that uh, I don't know how to do this. And for the whole first book, Kill My Mother, I would do a page, have a nervous breakdown, do another page, <laughs> have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> I had uh, three bronchial infections and two cases of pneumonia the first oh. year while doing the book, oh. all because um, uh, I was so scared of what the hell it was I was doing that I was not qualified to do. Oh. And they would find me out. And, um, and, then, and then the book worked. Yeah. Go figure. <laughs> and um, so that was the end of the nervous breakdowns, and I got on with the other two. Yeah. <laughs> Have a little scotch from your adolescence. Yeah, it's and, amazing uh, what, yeah, what, yeah. what, what acceptance yeah. will do. Yeah. So, but, yeah. I, but I also found that it was the form I wanted to work in for mm. the rest of my life yeah. because it gave me the freedom that age had, had stolen from me in, in, in other ways. Mm. You know, that, I, that I couldn't write plays because I'm deaf. I couldn't do this because of this. I couldn't do that because, of, but out on, on Shelter Island in New York, where I now live, uh, I can sit at my table and be any age I want to be mm. and do anything I want to do and play with it and you know and 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 have as much fun because nobody can tell me I'm an old fart because mm -hmm. there's nobody around to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one there to tell me, so I can pretend I'm any age I want to be. Yeah. And it's an incredible amount of, uh, of joy and freedom and, then I, and, 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 and the miracle of going back to working in a form mm -hmm. that I had given up because I was unqualified to and doing adventure strips again, as I, you know, being Kniff, being Eisner, doing you know, these these heroes of mine, yeah. uh, who, particularly in this last book, uh, the Ghost Script, mm -hmm. as I came near the end of the book, I felt their mentorship. Mm. I felt them looking over their shoulders, guiding me yeah. through to the rest of the book, and I felt such satisfaction that I could, uh, near ninety go back to being what I was at 9 and 10 and 11 mm. uh, and doing it as an art form mm. and doing it you know, uh, 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 as a political message which dealt with themes that were dear to my heart. Uh, and as I said, all of this was written long before Trump, but, the, but as, it, um, uh, as Trump became evident uh, um, in the illustration of the book, I didn't have to, too much to make it even more timely, but I did very little to update it to Trumpy. It was already in there because uh, these 
these persecutions are part of our history. Trump, there's nothing new about Donald Trump, except except he's more excessive than, you know, it, it's, we've elected Joe McCarthy president. That's the only difference. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, but we've been through this before. We've been through it in the 1890s, the 1910s, and 1920s, the Palmer Act. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've done dreadful things to immigrants all through our history. Uh, I mean, all of this is, this is, this is the, you, you want to make this is the real America, you know, and mm -hmm. um, and what we've done racially, you know, th from the very beginning, you, you, uh, uh, you from James Baldwin and Tanahishi Coates, you just read them and you will see that this, you know, country has been living an official life from the very first day, <laughs> we, we and um, and we've been accepting the mythology and the law, including liberals accepting it. Mm -hmm. And we go forward that, doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so the excitement is to see what happens next and to see what we can do about making the cynicism and untruths we've always lived by and justified, turning those around and, and, um, and against all odds, making this the country it pretended to be from you know, 1789 on. Mm. Well said. We have time for one or two questions, depending on if Jules, what he wants to say. We have microphones yeah. right there. They, they, for filming purposes, they'd like you to speak at the microphone if possible. If there's two of them. But, uh, and, and, you, and Jules, you do get into the House on American Activities and Ghost Script, and, yes, and it's yes. a short line from Roy Cohn is, is right there next to McCarthy to <laughs> mentoring Donald Trump. It's a direct lineage. Yes, please. I hope not. <laughs> well, OK, I'll, you got me. I'm really a Republican. <laughs> For my final act, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, please. No, I did that all that. Yeah. <laughs> I did all that. Where the hell you been? <laughs> but the comic book Legal Defense Fund uh, table has these books. Yeah. Yes, please. Oh. How do you feel about the uh, demise of the village voice? What's that? How do you feel about the demise of the village voice? Uh, my, in, my, in my opinion, the demise of the village voice happened years ago. Mm. Uh, and I mean, the village voice, my village voice was a lively, interesting, innovative uh, 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 paper which could be very silly and dumb and then be brilliant and, 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 and always argumentative, always provocative, it had uh, a person you couldn't stand on one page next to a person who you couldn't live without, you know, on another page, and kept a happy, it was, it, the, the word voice was operative. It believed mm -hmm. in letting yeah. anybody speak, whoever, you know, and didn't control, didn't try to editorialize, didn't try to censor. Um, and um, and operated as freewheeling style that affected the rest of journalism, and so the voice really didn't die. The newspaper died, yeah. but the voice, uh, the, the sense of the voice, you can find in in, in endless. You can find it in the Washington Post. You can follow, find it in the New York Times. The style of writing in the New York Times used to be deadly dull. The voice helped free that style and 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 yes. and, 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 and open it up and make it more literate and uh, and absorbed a lot of the writers from the voice, but the, the other writers from the Times just let themselves become good writers as opposed to writing in that dead Abe Rosenthalian Times style yeah. that, that so <laughs> predominated for so many years so when true. that awful man was at the helm of the paper. <laughs> uh, and and um, so the voice didn't die, it went on to take over journalism, so mm -hmm. there we are. Beautifully said. Well, please give a big hand to the greatest living, most humble, possibly Republican cartoonist, 90 in January, Mr. Jules Pfeiffer.